Welcome to Arts Chronicle. I'm John Everett, your host, and we're here at Gilcrease Museum to look at a painting that will lead us into the rest of our program. Here it is, The Four Moons, by legendary Creek Indian artist Jerome Tiger. As we look at it, we see four Indian maidens dancing through the stages of life, creation, youth, maturity, and finally, union with the Great Spirit. Now this painting is just one of several works by artists to commemorate the outstanding achievements of five Oklahoma Indian ballerinas. Moslin Larkin, Yvonne Shoto, Rosella Hightower, Marjorie Tallchief, and her sister, Maria Tallchief. They all shared an Indian heritage rooted in this state and all went on to achieve international fame as principal dancers with the most prestigious dance companies in the world. In one grand jeté, so to speak, they catapulted a state known for rodeos and stomp dances into the limelight of the world's most refined art. To honor them, Oklahoma artists have turned to music, choreography, painting, and sculpture in efforts to capture the glory these five Indian ballerinas have brought to our state. And for our Diamond Jubilee, all these elements came together for one touching and inspiring moment. And Gretchen Haas and Rex Doherty were there to tell us about it. The subtle beauty of ballet lies in the fact that ballet dancers are able to make even the most complicated movements seem simple. The same can be said for a good piece of art, or more specifically, for this sculptured ballerina by Tulsa artist Jay Amelia. Its apparent simplicity is deceiving. Like the very ballet movement it captures in bronze, the statue itself is a product of extremely hard work and special attention to detail. The story behind this nine-foot symbol of elegant thoroughbred dancers is the story of Omelia's dream and how he made it come true. This statue is Omelia's way of honoring five internationally famous ballerinas whose roots are right here in Oklahoma. I thought it was just a fascinating story of five gals who did something and represented Oklahoma. And I think it's a surprise to the East Coast and they cannot believe from Oklahoma in the ballet world of anything, you know. So I thought it should really be uh, honored in a sense. Moslin Larkin is one of the five ballerinas the statue represents. She and husband Roman Jasinski founded the Tulsa Ballet Theater. The Jasinskis were Omelia's technical consultants throughout the sculpturing process. Omelia said his original concept for the sculpture was much more involved than the final product and, as it turned out, far too impractical. I started, of course, to, in, you know, in my naive, creative world to, let's depict all five of them in a reflective pool, five bronze uh, figures in five attitudes of five different dances. But that was rather ambitious and I produced sketches and uh, renderings of the green where I thought it should go. And it was a little ambitious in the sense that uh, it, to put it on the green would have almost been impossible because of the weight primarily. And then the cost of it would have been astronomical to produce five life-size figures in the casting, etc. Omelia's way of salvaging his idea was to construct one large symbolic figure supported by five cylinders. The cylinders represent the number of ballerinas honored by the structure, and they also symbolize spotlights as if the ballerina were on stage facing an audience. It took him four years, but he finally got the financial backing from the community and the go-ahead from the city to sculpt not five six-foot statues, but one nine-foot statue. Using sketches and photographs, Omelia's ideas began to materialize. Mary Beth Miner was the first model until she injured herself and had to drop out of dancing. Then the principal ballerina for Tulsa Ballet Theater, Melissa Hale, stepped in. Starting with small wax figures, Omelia's ballerina began to take shape. It took four months to solve all the technical and aesthetic problems. He had to rework the hands and feet several times to get the proper attitude and pose. The Jasinski kept explaining to me about the foot, and the thigh area is taught to be twisted almost, you know, in a very 
doesn't look normal. But so anyway, that really where is where I worked out all my problems is in this little wax maquette, and then went to the three foot to because I didn't want to mess this one up after all that work, so I made a, a rough three foot so that I'd have an exact three times up measurement, which saved a lot of uh, fooling around, although even when I took it exactly three times up, I still had to eyeball it. But if I had to put that calf on there, the size that it read, she'd look like a 280 pound lineman. You know, it just would have been huge. Amelia continued to work the shape into the oil-based clay, but still, something didn't look right. We had to tear it all back down, take it all off again, start all over, because I goofed. I didn't get the attitude the way I was fighting it. So there was only one thing, I was to rip it all off again and start all over and re-weld it to get it the way I wanted it. That goof, as Amelia called it, cost him three weeks. Later in the process, a foot became a source of frustration. Then the eyes gave Amelia fits. I changed those about a half a dozen times to get the angle that I wanted from the elevation that you would see it from. Where is she going to be looking? And I first I had her look like she was on uh, <clears throat> a trip. And then it looked like she was falling asleep and all of these things. But we finally, you know, to get the angle that I wanted and what they felt it should be, too. Because she's supposed to be looking out in the audience, not down or not up. Whether it was fixing the eyes or adding that special something to make her look alive and in motion, Amelia says along the way he developed a love-hate relationship with his sculptured ballerina. Once the finishing touches were added, it was time to prepare her for the foundry. The clay was sealed with seven layers of lacquer, Silicone rubber was then applied. You'll notice there are seams on the statue. Those are markers for the foundry workers as they make the molds section by section. The water, the water, the plastic. Mm -hmm. How do you get it out of here to the foundry? I don't. The foundry came to me. They sent mold makers out, and they make molds from the big one. And then they remove those molds in sections. And as I say, there uh, will be 20 to 25 molds, individual molds. It's like a giant jigsaw puzzle. Amelia worked with the artists at Turkey Track Foundry in Tulsa to meet his deadline. A process that normally takes about five months was incredibly accelerated. The sprueing, investing, pouring, assembling, and chasing were meticulously executed in only 10 weeks, just in time for the planned unveiling. Most outdoor bronzes have a greenish tint to them, but a warmer patina was selected for this one. Its reddish-brown tint was chosen to depict the lifelike color of the Indian ballerinas it represents and to blend in with its surroundings here on the Williams Plaza Green in Tulsa. Omelia hopes the color will be enhanced with age and, as time goes on, that people will look at this statue and see what he intended to convey. A little-known story focusing on five Indian women whose talents as ballerinas have made Oklahomans proud and much like this statue, will withstand the test of time. This is the Four Moons Ballet, composed by Cherokee Indian composer Louis Ballard, a graduate of the University of Tulsa and a native of Miami, Oklahoma. Here the performance is by members of the Tulsa Ballet Theater for the Diamond Jubilee, but originally it was performed in 1967 by four of Oklahoma's five Indian ballerinas. One of them, Moslin Larkin, explains how the ballet came into being. Well, I've known Louis Ballard. He also went to Devil's Promenade as a child and he, in Miami, Oklahoma. We grew up in Miami, Oklahoma. So I've known him. And when we were wanting to do an American Indian ballet, and we knew how talented Lewis really is, and how creative 
we had talked with him. Uh, Lewis was studying at TU at that time. He was a student of Dr. Rocha's at TU. And when he graduated from TU, he, his graduating thesis was music for a ballet called Which Water Go, which he dedicated to Yasha and I. And uh, so he was the obvious person. He'd already, we had heard it, we had liked it. And uh, we talked to Lewis and we said, we want to do this and we don't know what to name it. Lewis actually composed the music, uh, designed the set, and gave us our theme for the ballet, The Four Moons. There are the five of us who are Oklahoma Indian ballerinas, all from Oklahoma, all part Indian, and in that day, we were among the first Ameri Americans in ballet companies. We were all in the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, and we all became ballerinas. We all love dance, we're all different, and um, the idea was that we had never all performed on a stage at the same time. We had been in companies together, but maybe two of us at a time or three. Uh, actually, Marie and Marjorie Tallchief never performed in a company together. One was in Ballet Theater and one was in Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo and the Marquis de Cuevas company. And um, everybody kept saying, wouldn't it be great for you all in the whole dance world if you could all perform at one time. It was originally intended to be five, but Maria had already quit dancing at that time. And we, we tried to talk her into it, but she wouldn't go back and go into training to come back. She said, no, I've already quit dancing. And so the, the five moons turned into four moons. As they gathered at Tulsa International Airport to go to the Jubilee festivities, the five ballerinas were once again four. Maria Tallchief was unable to come, but her sister Marjorie was there from Chicago, and just off a plane from France was Rosella Hightower. They joined the two now living in this state, Yvonne Choto of Oklahoma City and Mazlin Larkin of Tulsa. They called themselves Yesterday's Flowers, but even sitting under huge posters of themselves in the bloom of their careers, they seemed filled with a vibrant life. Yvonne Choteau recalls that first time back in 1967 when they danced the four moons together. But there was a wonderful spirit, a wonderful feeling to just stand in the wings and watch your sisters out there dancing. It was so wonderful, you could just feel it. It was a marvelous rapport. And we thought, well, it all started here in Oklahoma. For Marjorie Tallchief and her sister Maria, it all began in Fairfax, Oklahoma. They took their first dancing lessons in the basement of their home there. By the time they were teenagers, Marjorie was dancing with the American Ballet Theater, Maria with the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. Both have toured France and Russia, a long journey from Fairfax. This dance featuring Melissa Hale commemorates the tall chief's Osage heritage. The Osage were known as a proud, almost regal people. Their men were tall, fierce warriors. The choreography is by Marjorie's late husband, George Scabine.
The name is in gold letters on the door of an Oklahoma City dance studio, Yvonne Shoto. Not as glamorous as being on a marquee, where it was for many, many years, but neither is the scene inside. Youngsters in the awkward stage as dance awakens their legs and arms. And Shoto in a knitted shawl, encouraging, admonishing, reminding. And a gray-haired pianist trying to tempt shyness from little feet with bouncing melodies. The children are like little quail following their mother across the floor, each one hoping to fly and soar one day, even as she once did. But they will be lucky indeed if they can emulate one who began an international career when she was not much older than they are now. Yvonne Choteau was born in Veneta, of Shawnee and Cherokee Indian and French descent. She was the youngest American to join the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, 14 years old. She began dancing principal roles with them when she was 16. Fame and fortune ran after her like hungry foxes, but she says she outdanced them both. Because at that time, especially in the early 40s when I joined, ballet was very glamorous. We had fantastic parties and people would come in huge, li uh, you know, chauffeur driven li limousines and take us out to the nightclubs, sardis and so on. And, uh, Flowers would come backstage for you, and chocolates, and all the delicious things. And for a young person, it can be. But I did not succumb <laughs> to any temptation. Cynthia Cruz of Tulsa Ballet Theater performs the Cherokee portion of Four Moons, choreographed by Choteau's husband, Miguel Terracol. The dance, symbolizing a trail of tears, commemorates Choteau's Cherokee heritage, a heritage that she feels means a great deal to her career. in the speaking of the, the five Oklahoma Indian ballerinas has played an important part. I think the Indian, my father having been Shawnee Indian, of course I am one-fourth, uh, the Indians are very mystical and artistic people. And I think that to dance to the Indian is very natural. Dance is, you know, it's, it's not an art or a science, it's a way of life for the American Indian. You pray, you know, and you dance, you have all your tribal customs. Yvonne's father influenced her toward an artistic career. She says it was he who decided she should go into either opera or dance. But these dreams of ballet and opera didn't keep Mr. Shoto from taking the time to expose his young daughter to Native American culture as well. He would take me to all the reservations all over Oklahoma. I've been in every nook and cranny in Oklahoma and I would learn the Indian dances. And when I was five, he took me to a century of progress, the Chicago World's Fair, and that was my first appearance doing Indian dancing, <laughs> the ripe old age of five. magical evening in Oklahoma City, the two cultures met, the young Indian girl from Benita and a classical ballet company. I believe it would be about 1933 that my father and mother took me to see a performance of the original ballet roots de Monte Carlo down at the old Shrine Auditorium, downtown Oklahoma City. I saw the three baby ballerinas, Tumanova, Baranova, Ryabuzhenska, dance a ballet called Les Sylphides to the music of Chopin. And after seeing that ballet, I said, this is it. This is what I want to do. It was so beautiful and so moving and just the most ethereal thing I had ever seen. Very soft, lyrical dancing, which I later chose and which became my style of dancing.
Rosella Hightower, a Choctaw from Ardmore, studied ballet in Kansas City. She's been a soloist with the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, the American Ballet Theater, and the Grand Ballet of the Marquis de Cuevas. In 1980, she was appointed director of the Paris Opera Ballet, and she is the founder of the Center of Classical Dance in Cannes. Hightower herself choreographed this dance to symbolize the playful lightheartedness of the Choctaw people. Gail Gregory of Tulsa Ballet Theater is the soloist. Roslyn Larkin is co-director of the Tulsa School of Ballet and the Tulsa Ballet Theater. She and her husband, Roman Jasinski, have built the theater into one of eight major companies designated by the National Association of Regional Ballet. So the youngsters in their school are not only taught by two former stars of the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, they also get daily instruction and contact with the principal dancers of a professional ballet company. It's a much different start in dance than Moslem got as a young Shawnee Indian girl. Well, I grew up in Miami, Oklahoma. My father is an American Indian. My mother is Russian. And at first I hated ballet because the tech, it's, you know, to stand at a ballet bar and was very confining. And uh, young American, uh, American Indian children loved to run free. My little Indian wanted to run free really did and resented the confinement and discipline of the classical ballet. But once I had the technique, enough of the technique of the classical ballet, that gave me the freedom of expression, I was caught by ballet for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. 